Good morning and welcome to the 11th meeting of the Education, Children and Young People Committee in 2022. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Ruth Maguire, who's joining us this morning for the first time as a member of the committee. And I'd also like to welcome Graeme Day, who has also become a member of the committee after previously participating as a substitute member. So welcome to both Ruth and Graham. Ruth and Graham are replacing Fergus Ewing and, Graham, uh, and James Dornan. On behalf of all the members, I'd like to thank James and Fergus for their contribution to the work of the committee this session. As Ruth McGuire is joining us for the first time today, our first item of business is to invite Ruth to declare any relevant interests. Ruth. Thank you, Convener. I'm um, very much looking forward to contributing to the committee's important work. I have no relevant interests to declare this time. Thank you very much. The second item on our agenda today is an evidence session for our Scottish Attainment Challenge inquiry. This morning we will be taking evidence from representatives of the trade unions. And I'd like to welcome Greg Dempster, the General Secretary of the Association of Head Teachers and Deputies in Scotland, AHDS. Andrea Bradley, the Assistant Secretary of the Education Education and Quality, the Educational Institute of Scotland, the EIS. Mike Corbett, was National Official Scotland of the NESUWT, and they're all joining us remotely. So I've got an eye on a monitor here. Uh, when uh, you wish to contribute, I'll try and get you in by keeping an eye on the chat function. And also to Jim Thewlis, who is the General Secretary of the, Scot of the School Leavers Scotland, who is with us in the committee room. You're very welcome, Jim. So I would like to be school leaders, Scotland, actually. Rather than what did I say? Leader, school leavers, Scotland. Did I? Oh, right, OK. That <laughs> Something <was> different <laughs> altogether. All right, OK. That, 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 I, it's fine, correct. School leaders, Scotland. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, so good morning to you all, and um, thank you for your time. Let me uh, begin uh, the questioning, if I may, this morning, with a very simple question in relation to the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the associated funds that flow with it. Has it worked? Greg Dempster. Um, thanks, Convener. That's quite a big question to, <laughs> to start off with. And um, given the objective of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the government's objective overall to be closing the poverty-related attainment gap, plainly that has not happened. So if that's what you mean, then no, it hasn't achieved that objective. But um, <clears throat> obviously we are not hugely far along this road um, of having the Attainment Challenge and Pupil Equity funded. Um, and in the main, members welcome the Pupil Equity funding and agree with its purpose. And we could see from um, the Audit Scotland report and uh, other publications that there was progress beginning to be made on that agenda. So. As always with these things, it's not quite as crisp and clear as yes or no. OK, Andrea Bradley, has it, is it working? Has it worked? I think, I think a, a bit like Greg has suggested, um, the, the ambition is you know, absolutely right and correct. It's right and correct that the Scottish Government has the ambition that it does and that there has been the, you know, the sort of like cross-party consensus around the you know, the objectives of the Attainment Challenge, they are absolutely shared by the EIS and, and its members. Um, but I think it's too soon to say whether um, or not it has worked, because it has to be a long-range, long-term endeavour. It is simply not possible to close the poverty-related attainment gap, you know, with all the structural inequalities that we have within such a, a short space of time. In terms of the, the kinds of initiatives that have been um, started and um, developed through Scottish Attainment Challenge funding. I think that the jury is out a bit in terms of the, the effectiveness of them. I think that in some areas they have been effective, in other areas perhaps less so. Um, and certainly EIS members report a bit of a mixed picture in terms of the, you know, the, the overall impact of the Scottish Attainment Challenge funding and endeavour, including the PEF component of that. I think that we see some examples of really good practice having emerged, um, you know, supported by the funding, and in other places maybe um, more dubious or less reliable um, approaches um, adopted. And I, I would say that probably what has been missing um, from, from a lot of this is a really effective way of evaluating impact um, across the short, medium, 
and longer term. And I think that that's something that you know that we have to think about um, as we continue on this rightful um, endeavour. Um, but I think that at the moment, I think that that you know it's probably not realistic to ask the question anyway. Has it worked? I think we can say. Has it been working? Have we seen any elements of success that we can build upon? I think that the answer to that is yes. Um, there's a lot to learn from what has been working. A lot of um, I think that there's a lot that needs to be done to share the um, the experiences around what has been working among teachers. Um, we need to create opportunities for collaboration among teachers in order that we can um, you know make further progress um, and for that to be more to be more universal. And I think that there's some opportunity now in the fact that the framework has been adjusted, such as um, to include all 32 local authorities, whereas originally there were only nine authorities included within the attainment challenge, albeit that um, HEF money was being distributed to almost all schools um, over the last over the last few years. So I think that with the new kind of like framing of all of this, there is opportunity for us to do more. And definitely, and I think it's really important that we seize and grasp that to the best of our to the best of our ability. Andrew, you raise a lot of really good points, which I'm sure that we will pursue during the next hour and a half or so. Um, in 2019, the EIS um, commissioned a, a survey of, of, of teachers, and apparently, in that survey, only 26% of teachers thought that. Um, the uh, attainment challenge funding and, and PEF was making any difference to the most deprived children and young people. I think 26% is the number. 31% said they'd seen no difference, and 43% said basically they didn't know. Um, three years later, would that still be reflective, do you think, of the views of the members of the EIS? Uh, well, we haven't uh, we haven't gone back to them um, so recently with that question. We did ask a more general question of certain cohorts of our members about the impact of stack more generally, and we were getting, um, I suppose, more of the the kind of insight from that series of questions into the kind of strategic decisions that local authorities were making. So it was more about what local authorities were doing at that level, um, but certainly that data around PEF was concerning for us um, and. It seemed to it seemed to point it seemed to point to the fact that too many teachers were being left out of decision making at school level about how PEF money should be spent. And, and from our point of view, we see it that teachers are the experts. You know, teachers are the experts in terms of being able to assess the needs of young people, knowing the kinds of interventions to to put in place in order to to support them. But you know, critically across too many, too many schools, too many local authority areas, teachers have not been involved in the decision-making processes around which young people will be included. You know what the what the nature of the intervention should be, and um, how that how that will be evaluated, and how to then build progress. Um, you know, after an initial series of of interventions, and and certainly when the when PEF money um, was first being dispersed by the Scottish government. We wrote guidance for our members about the importance of them being involved in decision making about it, and we were, were not convinced as yet. You know that data would suggest that as yet um, we're not there yet in terms of the you know the kind of like um, processes and structures and cultures um, around collegiate decision making with regards to PEF. And I think that where you have that, where you have like where you actively seek and involve. Teacher expertise, you're likely to have stronger outcomes, and certainly you're likely to have teachers much more in the know about how the money is being spent and how effective or not um, that spend um, that spending has been. Thank you. Um, my call, but back to my original question: um, Is it working? Has it worked? Well, if you look uh, on a very simple level, I mean, if you take, for example, Professor Lindsay Patterson of Edinburgh Universities. Uh, judgment, uh, he would say no, because as he rightly pointed out, uh, Scotland raised low status students by less than, than in England and actually depressed uh, high state, the achievements of high status. Um, on that measure, uh, perhaps the, the, the gap had narrowed, but, but not in the way that we'd all want it to. Um, I suppose there is also a question about, you know, is attainment narrow a focus? Um, a lot of recent work in relation to potential education reform talks about uh, looking at uh, the four capacities of CFE, 
you know, confident individuals, effective contributors, um, and the focus on attainment perhaps taking away from that side of things. So there, there is perhaps um, some merit in, in looking more broadly at things. Are we measuring the right things uh, in the first instance? Um, but I don't, I, I don't think there's any doubt that everyone uh, around the table today will no doubt have examples of good practice. Um, I think some of the issues are about having time for teachers to share that good practice where it's been evident, uh, and also, uh, again, building on Andrea's point, uh, time for teachers to properly get involved in planning, um, to properly engage with research and reflect on what may or may not work properly. Um, and all of this, and again, I think this is acknowledged in various reports that we've had, touches on the fact that, that schools can't be left on their own to you know, sort out the poverty-related attainment gap. So we do, we do welcome the references to collective agency um, that have been in recent reports, and it has to be a multi-agency approach. Uh, but again, that in itself raises challenges about you know, teachers having the time to engage with those outside outside agents, because the teachers are undoubtedly the ones who are at the sharp end and they have the best ideas, but they need the time to get those acknowledged and to contribute. Thank you, Michael. Come back to, if I, I'm going to come back to something that you just said and get the response of the other panellists uh, this morning to it. But first of all, I think um, I owe it to Jim Thewlis to give him the opportunity of the answer to my original question. Is uh, it working? Uh, thanks, Convener, and I um, make the point that perhaps you didn't ask one question, you asked two questions, and the answer is, is slightly different. It's important that we make the, the difference in, uh, in that answer. And that is it working and has it worked are not the same question. Has it worked? Um, no, it hasn't, and I don't think we've had the opportunity to see it fully through to understand if it has worked. Is it working? Yes, I think it is. And the, 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 the response is very much based on evidence which is anecdotal. And I think we've been thrown sideways, we, not, we have been thrown hugely sideways by what the virus has done to the school environment and the school ethos over the course of the past two years. But it's important uh, and within what we have done now in terms of restructuring uh, the, the way in which funding is going to be taken into schools, the way in which it's going to be used within schools, and the way in which uh, the, the evaluation of its impact is going to be taken forward, that we start to look at it now in a more coherent way. It has been good and it has been useful for schools, and it has had an impact on young people and young people's learning. What I think we've got to start to look at now is something which is more longitudinal. To start to answer the second question which you asked is, you know, is it working, but has it worked? And we start to get closer to the has it worked part of it. And I think in terms of the has it worked part of it, we've also got to be very clear in our understanding of what we you know, what does that mean? What does working mean? What is the what are the intended outcomes of this? And we started off within this uh, in all good faith in relation to looking at young people and young people's literacy, numeracy and health and well being. Two of those we have done kind of well on, because the, the, the way in which we measure those and the, 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 the structure and way in which we do that already exists. The health and well-being will come back to in a moment, because that we have not really looked at that in the sort of detail that perhaps we could have done. And given what the virus has done, how we should now be looking at that very much more in depth and much more carefully, because it was, has, a, has a serious impact on all other aspects of learning and young people's development. And I think that's something which the, uh, requires a huge kind of teasing out and a start to look, starting to look at it in a way in which we can actually understand process as well as outcome. But if we start to look at it more longitudinally, we start to look at it uh, in terms of the way in which we use and understand the data which is there. Then we move away from the anecdotal more to get some sort of understanding of what is actually happening in relation to the journey towards the desired outcome. If we come, become much more refined in the way in which we use the funding which is there and the way in which we put processes based on data into schools, then we, come, we, we have an out, a, a more clear idea of what outcome is and answering the question, has it worked, we get closer to doing that. And if we look at stuff which is, is more measurable, in relation to the way in which we look at input 
and define output on the basis of the process which takes us from input to output. So we are at a place at the moment where we could have been much more towards answering the has it worked question. The virus has not helped us in that sort of a way. Having looked at what we have done and identified the areas in which we could do it better, then the report which we have here and the structure and going forward is much, much more useful in relation to being able to us to, to, to enabling us to become clearer on what we see working, not working, could be working better, and in relation to literacy, numeracy, and more importantly, health and well-being, starting to position the activities and the actions which we are taking to actually target what we want to have as an, an effective output. I think I'll stop at that. Yeah, Jeremy, you've raised a lot of issues, and I know my colleagues in the committee will want to come back to you on a, quite a few of the points you've raised. Um, I want to just refer back to what Mike Corbett said. He quoted Professor Lindsay Patterson in an article uh, in the TES in which he said, inequality also fell in England mainly by raising the low-status students while also raising high-status students. Scotland raised low-status students by less and depressed high-status students. It may not be reasonable to describe this as better progress towards equality of outcome in Scotland than in England. That was, I think, part of the quote that, um, that Mike was referring to. And then Mike also asked the question, is attainment too narrow a focus? So can I ask you, first of all, Jim, to respond to the quote from Lindsay Patterson and also answer the question that, that Mike raised. Is attainment too narrow a focus? Uh, I would suggest that attainment is too narrow a focus, yes, in particular when we start to look at the health and well-being aspects of this and the way in which young people learn within the school environment, the way in which young people exist within the local environment out with school. And if we're going to start to engage, as I think we should be doing, we must be doing, with local community and local community support and input to school, to start to look at the holistic development of young people, then the focus on attainment is too narrow a focus. To an extent, it's, it's the easy one. And I suppose in starting this, you start with what is easy and what is doable. What we're now doing is starting to move into the areas which are more challenging. And it's right and proper that we do that to start to understand within the, the four capacities of Curriculum for Excellence just exactly how the three capacities which we kind of haven't looked at start to be un, un, unwound a bit in relation to the way in which the school environment operates within the local circumstances in which it exists. Does have a point? Uh, I think Lizzie Patterson does have a point, yes. OK, thank you. Um, Andrea Bradley, um, your comments. So, um, like, um, like Jim has said, um, we would say that the focus on attainment is, is too narrow, um, and particularly in the context of, of recovery, um, it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hit the nail on the head in terms of what is required, um, you know, in terms of support of the, the the young people whose communities have been and families have been hardest hit by the by the pandemic. I think it's 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 you know misframed in terms of in terms of their needs at the moment and arguably um, always has been. Um, even even within that sort of like relatively narrow focus on attainment, albeit that health and well being sits, you know, sits alongside that, but it's had less less of an emphasis um, over the years than literacy and numeracy have. And um, even within those already pretty narrow measures, there's a really narrow focus um, for example within literacy. Um, because the assessment of literacy doesn't take account of all of the skills and, and um, knowledge and um, experiences that young people would be developing um, in the course of their learning on literacy. It focuses on a very, very narrow range of, of, of them. Um, so, so, yeah, we, have, we have, had, uh, have had concerns about that. We think there should be a much more holistic approach. Um, and even, even, even thinking about attainment, to focus solely on literacy and numeracy for many young people is the wrong way around, because the way that they will learn best 
will be in subjects that maybe don't obviously have literacy and numeracy at the forefront of um, of the, the learning experiences, albeit that they are embedded within them. And um, so that that has always been a concern of ours um, about um, a, a, about the, the framing of this. And Andrea, um, and if I if, sorry to interrupt you, um, and Andrea, in relation to Lindsay Patterson's comment about his comparative statement, the Scotland raised low status students by less than depressed high status students. Is he has he got a point? Um, I, I, I would like to see Lindsay's evidence for that. I would like to see Lindsay's evidence for that. Certainly, certainly from from our perspective, um, our, our members are very much focused on, you know, the, the terms of the mission, which are to raise the attainment of all and reduce the poverty related. Um, for us, it should be achievement gap rather than rather than attainment gap. Um, and, and I'm not sure that there's evidence to suggest that um, that there's been a depression of overall attainment as we have been working towards that okay. particular um, endeavour. OK, and lastly, and then I'll turn to Co-Cab Stewart, the Deputy Convener. Um, Greg Dempster, your response to um, the question that I asked and also uh, Lindsay Patterson's statement. Um, I would agree with what Jim and Andrea have already set out around about the, the focus. And in terms of Professor Patterson's statement, um, I'm not sure what data sets he's referring to in making that statement. So like Andrea, I would want to see a little bit more about that. But um, something I would add is that the attainment challenge and people equity funding are a small part of the overall system. They sit within a much wider spend on education. And what we often hear from members, and that it's a, a tension point in this, is that they're faced with reducing core budgets at the same time as having um, money in place for, for PEF and for SAC. And so perhaps that spend is guarding against a depression of outcomes for um, the disadvantaged peoples uh, in a system that's seeing a, a reduction in overall spend. OK, OK, OK. So thank you, Greg. Lots of points there. And it's a fascinating discussion. But I have to turn to Kokab Stuart. Kokab. Thank you, convener. Um, I just want to sort of like uh, look more specifically uh, um, in how head teachers uh, involve uh, teachers, parents and actually pupils um, when they're deciding their priorities uh, for allocating the funding, uh, of the attainment challenge funding. Um, so I suppose I'm going to start with Greg Dempster, if that's OK. Have head teachers had enough support or training uh, from local authorities um, so that they are well informed and well equipped to make decisions about the, the additional funding that's been provided? With any question about local authorities, it's 32 uh, different varieties, obviously, so the experience in different parts of the country will be, will be very different. Mm. Um, I can't give you a clear sort of uh, researched response to that question um, in the sense that we haven't been asking members about that aspect of it for at least the, the, um, the pandemic period. Um, so, so I can't give you a, a full answer on that. I do know that um, school leaders are always extremely pressed for time, mm. extremely stretched in terms of workload. Um, so it, any help that they can have to signpost addition, um, um, quality interventions that they can then engage with their staff about and talk about would these be appropriate in our situations are always welcome. And there was quite a lot of work at the start of the um, attainment challenge and PEF funding being available to signpost resources that did, did just that. But I know that Andrea has been looking much more closely um, at uh, school experience, so perhaps she can give you a little more. Mm. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm just, I suppose where I'm coming from with this is that, you know, head teachers are uh, promoted through being teachers and coming through and the, the skills of being expert 
sort of leaders of learning, I suppose, and then coming into being financial wizards in, in a sense, you know, and making best use of that and being accountable for sometimes vast amounts of money. Um, so that scrutiny uh, and the responsibility has to be supported. So I suppose that was where I was going, was that were they getting enough support? And was that the best yeah. use of their time? Um, you mentioned about any additional support by head teachers being pressed for time. Have you any uh, thoughts on what that kind of support would look like? Well, always when we do a workload survey with our members, um, the lack of management time available in schools is an issue that comes to the fore, the lack of protected time for school leaders. Um, and so uh, that if, if you're in school and you're being pulled away to support individual pupils on a one-to-one -one basis, so if you're being pulled in to cover classes, that obviously swallows up time that you can could be using to look at um, interventions on a more strategic level or the data within your school to pinpoint areas for, for action and improvement and looking at um, research and evidence about what might be able to address those gaps. Mm -hmm. So um, we've seen over the years a number of areas where local authorities have reduced the management hours available in schools or the number of management posts. And clearly that has a huge impact on capacity to, to undertake the work that you're talking about. So it's a, a constant um, message that we get from members about the lack of management time. So that is clearly something that we would seek to have addressed to um, enable them to take forward their schools as effectively as possible. Thanks, Greg. Can I um, go to Andrea and Mike, please, um, just to sort of like move on from, well, it's a similar thread, actually. Um, I know that sort of having worked in schools extensively myself as well, that um, we want to make sure that money is used for additional staffing because those are the staff that are in front of children and the contact between you know experts and children is going to help them directly um, but there was evidence that i saw where that additional funding was used uh, to increase uh, principal teachers for instance so i'm wanting to drill down this bit about extra management time and the value of money for that versus the extra uh, experts that are in front of pupils and increasing that pupil-teacher contact, which I believe, certainly, is a good way of, you know, uh, increasing attainment and achievement. Um, so, Andrea, uh, do you have anything to say about that? So, in the, the research that we did in 2019, some of the... Um, we were asking members how they saw PEF money being spent, and certainly um, recruitment of additional principal teachers was one of the, you know, one of the actions that that, that, that was cited by, you know, quite a significant number, significant number of members. I suppose the I suppose the question of the the, you know, the utility of that is dependent on what those teachers are doing. Mm. If it's if it's someone who also has a considerable amount of time spent in the classroom. But is also leading the professional learning, if you like, in the school or the learning community, with re, uh, with regards to equity and the kinds of interventions that will that will make a difference. Then that 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 is probably a, a good model. And um, if 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 the the time is being spent um, solely on you know kind of management, strategic you know kinds of activities. But that's not been able to make an impact at classroom level. Then that would be a model that we would consider to be flawed. And um, so it would be. It's very much down to, I suppose, the balance of time being spent by that. You know, by by those individuals and what their remits are, the size of their remits, how realistic their remits are. I mean, I think Greg's point about management time is absolutely crucial to all of this as well. You know, people. People who are in strategic roles or who have leadership responsibility, you know, for key initiatives within a school or a learning community, have to have the time to be able to um, design that, to collaborate with colleagues around that, to then work on the implementation. Because I think quite often what happens um, in education is that there can be really good plans devised, you know, really, really um, creative and thoughtful plans devised, but the, the the kind of lapse comes at the point of implementation because there simply hasn't been the time for 
proper communication and collaboration among colleagues that allow those plans to be fully impactful. And I think that we're talking then about not just the numbers of principal teachers or the amount of management time that senior leaders have, we're talking about the numbers of teachers that there are to carry out the work as well, um, you know, to actually make the difference in the classroom in these close interactions with young people. So we see class sizes as being absolutely crucial, fundamental you know, to, to, to this endeavour, to closing the poverty-related attainment gap, achievement gap. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Mike, um, is there anything that you wanted to add to what Andrea has said? Yeah, thanks. I'm actually going to refer to, we did a wee snapshot survey just over the last three weeks um, of members, and there are other things I might refer to later, but one of the things was when they were asked about the effective solutions for, for tackling the issues around, you know, tackling the poverty-related attainment gap, the, the top four things that came out were more support services for schools, such as uh, CAMS and educational psychologists, more support staff in the classroom, more teachers, and tackling unemployment for parents. Now, I, I think there's an issue here about what is really national um, and should be funded nationally, uh, and what should be funded locally, perhaps through People Equity Fund, Scottish Attainment Challenge money, because it's, it's much further down that list you start to see things like breakfast clubs, which I know, uh, you know, have, you know, that's how some of the money has been used in the past and used very effectively. So I think there's, a, there's an issue worth consideration there about, you know, how much of the funding via here, via this initiative, should be spent on, for example, you know, employing more teachers or teachers in promoted posts, etc. Um, although having said that, and, and others have touched on this, the, the evidence that we do have of things working well is anecdotal, um, but the, you know, I have seen um, in the local authority area I used to work for, Eastern Bartonshire, some very good work where um, they've, they've used some of the money for promoted principal teacher posts, um, and that has allowed time for some of those principal teachers to focus on smaller groups of children. Um, so, you know, it's pretty complex, but I do think some of those things that our members seem to be saying um, would be helpful, really linked to national areas, and I think there are a lot of other potential mm. initiatives that, that maybe the, the money would be better spent on locally, but it's finding out what those are uh, and sharing good practice that I think is vitally important. And just kind of, if I could briefly go back to the point about um, head teachers and how they involve staff, again, it's a patchwork picture. Some are very good. Uh, some don't seem to involve their, their staff or pupils at all, and sometimes you know, they're well intentioned to have good ideas, but but we again would be saying there there needs to be much more involvement of classroom teachers in the planning stage and the decision making about how funding should be spent. Mm, thanks for that, Mike. Uh, just to finish off, can I um, bring Jim in? Um, Jim, how can we? Um, well, how can head teachers be supported to sort of like you know to evaluate the effective use of uh, the additional funding and to be empowered enough to stop doing the stuff that doesn't work, uh, to keep doing the stuff that does, um, and actually consider doing different things um, as well. <laughs> uh, th thanks for that. And I'll come back to it in, in various ways, but to, to, to touch on one or two points that have already been made. What we're talking about here is funded in equity and the, the deliver of equity at school level through the, the variety of strategies which are there. I want to make the point now, you know, to try and deliver equity across 32 local authorities is it's just it's, it's impossible because we're all starting off from different starting points. There are 32 different staffing formulas across Scotland, and there are 32 different funding formulas across Scotland. So, you know, depending on where your school is and which local authority it is, the number of staff whom you have to deliver any initiative and the amount of cash which you have to deliver any initiative varies enormously. And we have surveyed members over the course of the past 15 years three separate occasions, and the inequity is becoming worse. So if you're looking at delivering equity within schools, can we start to look at something aligned to a minimum basic staffing formula and a minimum basic funding formula? Because what we have here in relation to the paper we're discussing this morning is additionality. And additionality lies at the core of delivering equity. If there's a basic minimum which is there, which is then 
topped up and added to through whichever additional fund is given, then we start to look at something which enables schools and empowers schools to start to target resources and start to target staff in a way which is appropriate to the local community and the needs of the young people within that local community. To come back to answering the other parts of your question, uh, Greg and I kind of view this kind of slightly differently, and I think it's important to make the point that the, that, that reflects primary sector and secondary sector. And then secondary sector, following on from TP21, we have had a um, reasonable experience in the way in which we manage the funding which we are given to us. We are very much up for the whole notion of funding coming directly to schools and being used within the schools. And in terms of the support, again, harking back to TP21, every school was supposed to have a business manager. All schools do not have business managers. And that comes back to what's happened across local authorities and the way in which money which was given out at that point in time was not spent for, for that purpose. So we are potentially in a significantly better position in relation to the way in which funding is used within schools. And that it's not, you know, it is an admin issue, of course it's an admin issue, but it's not the admin issue within secondary schools that it is within primary schools. If the school has a business manager, trained business manager, and well-paid business manager to do that, that's another issue I know, but it's important we're going to start to look at the way in which we support young people within school through the allocation of staffing resource and funding resource. But we start to you know, look at decision-making and empowerment all through the report and through various other reports which are there, decisions taken at the point of most impact are the decisions which have greatest impact. Schools know their local community, they know the young people who are walking through <coughs> the door, they know the parental background, and Mike's point around the, the whole notion of parental unemployment plays exactly into this. We know our local environments. So we're able to reflect that in the way in which we then start to make decisions, and at all levels. If decisions are based in the first, in, in the first instance on the identification of clear outcomes, why are we doing this? Why are we spending this money? Why are we appointing this person into post? Now, the argument round about should it be somebody at classroom level, in the large part, yes, it should be, because that's where impact is made. But if a decision at a school level is round about the way in which you appoint someone to a principal teacher post, to take one example, into a support position within the school. To take another example, if those decisions are made on the basis of identified need and, outcome, and the outcome being clearly outlined at the start, then when it starts to come to accountability and coming back to the convener's first question, is it working, you get a better and more clear opportunity to actually answer that question away from the anecdotal and start to say, here, are the, here is what, the, what has happened in terms of an um, impact on young people's learning and health and well-being, social accountability, the way in which they interact within their local community, and the way in which you support families within the local community. Empower schools to do that. Start off with an equitable playing field, and you get a better chance at the end of answering the question, has it worked? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Graham Day. Uh, thank you, and good morning to the panel. Um, the premise of PEF, as I recall, was to empower uh, head teachers and their staff uh, because they were the best placed uh, individuals and groups uh, to understand the needs of the school. Um, so I was a little bit concerned um, at Andrea Bradley's comments about teachers being left out of the decision making process. But I think Mike Corbett's comments perhaps cleared that up, that there are some very good examples where the teaching staff are involved in the decision making. There are just some where that hasn't happened. Um, so that's kind of covered where I want, probably wanted to go at the outset. But I guess my, my, my first of my two questions is around um, the nature of how PEF is uh, deployed, because there's been a number of comments of, that have suggested that it's about who does what in a school and how they go about it. But some of the best examples I've certainly come across um, about the use of PEF have involved some more innovative, innovative uh, things. For example, the appointment of 
touristy officers to visit families in a very supportive way to understand better why children aren't attending school. I've also had examples of the secondary schools in clusters putting maths teachers into the primary schools because they were finding that the kids weren't as well prepared as they should be for coming to secondary on the maths front. So I just wonder if you would recognise that there is more to the use of PEF than simply the deployment of resources within the individual schools. And perhaps direct that to um, uh, uh, Craig uh, Dempster in the first instance. Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, and, and, you know, other examples uh, would be the use of homeschool link workers, that sort of thing as well. I think that um, there's a lot of work uh, uh, that, that isn't simply just more of the same within schools. So I would entirely agree with you. Jim Poulos. Uh, thanks. A couple of points here. The first is within the, the report itself, the, the, I picked out the statement freedom within a framework, and I think that is very much reflects what you are saying there. And it comes back to what I said within my, my previous comments about decisions being, making, being made at the local level and in a way which reflects the school background. So that one or two of the examples which you have picked up are absolutely correct in relation to the way in which schools can respond to a local need. One of the wee worrying things which was in, in, in the report which, which we were issued was the, the whole notion of how you know, looking at strategy and how strategy comes around. And it touches on the collegiality part that we've been speaking about earlier on. Because if strategy is driven from the ground up and local authorities then report, you know, look to support the strategies which schools are devising, then you're in a much better place of enabling and empowering schools to respond to young people's need in the sort of ways which you are suggesting, rather than have strategy coming from local authority down to school, and school has got to find its way through what the local authority is expecting of it. Schools are more than happy to be held accountable in relation to the strategies which they put in place if they are empowered to make those strategies in the first place, as opposed to having them imposed upon them in a local authority-wide structure. Thank you. And, and in fairness, I would name checked Andrea uh, Bradley uh, and Mike Corbett. I should give them the chance to comment. Andrea Bradley. Yes, yeah, so we, we've got a, a lot of um, anecdotal um, evidence that schools are pooling resources and working within learning community structures um, to maximise the impact of the, you know, the resources that they have. So instead of you know, each school working with their smaller portion of resourcing, and we know that some schools have actually got quite sizeable PEF budgets, but some, some um, because of the numbers of young people um, you know, within their, within their pupil cohort who would um, you know, qualify for, for an allocation of PEF funding, it has been decided um, at, you know, at, at, at school community level to, to pull that funding together and to share, um, you know, to share the resource that can be purchased, whether it be staffing, whether it be equipment, whether it be, for example, one of one of the examples that we got was um, a, a school bus being purchased. So that being shared across, you know, across um, school communities to enable, sorry, with across the school community to enable the young people within that community to get the benefit of outdoor trips, you know, residentials, you know, that, that sort of thing. So there is there is good, you know, there is good evidence of, of schools taking a more um kind of like collegiate and community approach um to maximise the impact of the funding. Okay, thanks. And Mike Corbett. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, I'm just to touch on uh, one of your first points about the truancy officer. I mean I noted there's just uh, some research come out just last month. Um, done by Strathclyde University, the Poverty Alliance, the GTC, Economic and Social Research Council, uh, which has reinforced the point that overall absences, according to them, are negatively associated with academic achievement. Um, so, you know, and that to me is ideal in that we've got some research evidence there that is informing, you know, what can then be good practice and good use of the money, and and that's one example that you've touched on there. Um, but I mean, there, there are other things. For example, uh, that you know, the, the Child Poverty Action Group um, have focused on with their cost of the school day surveys in terms of you know a, a lot of kids missing out on things because they don't have the funds for for school trips and and for non-uniform days, etc. Uh, and just to give you one quote from a, a teacher last week on our survey, who said that they have had in the school 
cost of the school day training, which has had a big impact on how they deliver things because they no longer ask pupils to bring money to school and no contributions are asked for for uh, non-uniform days. There's a reduction in the number of sponsored events uh, throughout the year. And again, so this all touches on the fact that, that there's good practice out there in a variety of ways, but what's absolutely crucial is for time for teachers and schools to share that good practice yeah. to then inform the planning um, you know, and that should lead to better outcomes overall in the end, you would hope. Thank you. I've got one, one more uh, question. And I, I think in the first instance, it's probably best uh, directed initially to, uh, to Greg and Jim again. Um, the EIS survey uh, talked about some instances where it was felt that PEF funding had been used contrary to the guidance to plug gaps arising from uh, cuts in, in, in the more general budget. I'm just wondering if that is still something that's being seen. A, an example I came across was where a local authority was halfway through a training programme for the entire teaching staff and its employment. And then along came PEF and it was suggested to the head teachers in the remaining schools who had not got, had the course that they could use PEF funding uh, to pay for that, to avoid the local authority having to meet the cost. Is that sort of thing still going on, or are we seeing a set one down in the approach? Uh, do you want me to go first? Please. Yeah. Um, we are still seeing that. We are still seeing that. And the difficulty um, here is that there's not a baseline that says, here's the money that schools already have, and here's your PEF funding, which is additional. So when the uh, funding that's within a school or an authority goes down, um, some of that PEF's fundi funding might not really be additional, uh, depending on your definition of that. It might be to prevent a reduction in staffing or a reduction in what is being offered within a school. So you might lose um, a couple of support staff because of a change of funding or policy within an authority and then use PEF funding to um, retain those staff because you know that's what you need to make a difference or that there will be a negative impact from losing them. Um, similarly, um, when there are ASN or behavioural issues, sometimes that's supported through PEF funding when that those children might not be receiving free school meals because the resource to support them um, isn't there otherwise. So that does still exist, yes, Mr Day. Thank you. And Jim Thulis? Uh, not, not to repeat to what Greg has said, you know, the, the answer is yes, it still does exist in schools. It's not nearly as blatant as it was uh, in the early stages of this, when a number of local authorities were taken to account by the, the Cabinet Secretary and the way in which they were, they were starting to do things. But it's there, it's hidden, and it's systemic. And the reason why it is systemic is because the local authority can hide that within what they are doing. If we have, as Greg says, a base level, and if we have, if we have local authority, I'm not for, for a minute suggesting we do away with the level of governance which sits between Scottish Government and between schools. Empowerment is not about that. But if empowerment is based on local authorities being there and acting as an agency to support the schools and to enable the schools to spend the funding and use the staffing available in the best possible way, and we use funding at school level to buy into the services which are re we require at local authority level. That's an entirely different ethos from local authorities as they do at the moment, filtering the fund before it gets to school level and deciding that they will take forward certain initiatives in certain ways which they feel to be, the bene to, to, be to the benefit of schools. And I know the EIS survey has reported in that on numerous occasions. But that's an ethos thing, and we need to look at that in the way in which the level of, la layer of governance which sits between Scottish government and schools operates and functions to support as an agency to schools, not as a filter. Thank you. Thank you. Convener. Greg Dempster, I think, wants to come back in to, to you, Graham. Yeah, it, it's not to disagree with what Jim is saying, but just to, to qualify it to a degree, in the sense that we survey members uh, annually as part of a workload survey, and one of the things that we ask them is uh, whether they feel that they have an appropriate degree of autonomy in relation to PEF and SAC funding. And the vast majority respond to say that they do. So um, 
for, for most school leaders, they don't feel that they're being directed in that spend. But there are times, to, to address Mr. Day's point, where they are choosing to spend that on um, items that have been cut by the local authority. Well, that clarifies what, what my point was. In there. Okay. Thank you, Kavira. Okay, thank you. Oliver Mundell. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, just following on from that line of questioning, I mean, I think the obvious thing to say is there is a gap. Uh, you know, in schools schools are not being always been properly funded. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's not. I mean, I, I think I wouldn't want to defend you know, spending you know, attainment funding on other things. But you know, certainly, schools I see locally don't don't always have a choice, um, and, and keeping staff on it, it, you know is a is a priority. Uh, you know, for, for head teachers. Um, would, would you agree with that, Mr. Dempster? Um, I think, it, it, in part, I would agree with that. Yes, in the sense that um, if you take the last period, the last uh, from the, the turn of the year to now, the absence levels in schools have been enormous. And so, if you have a, let's call them a PEF teacher, just for simplicity within your school, supporting different initiatives, but you have a lot of other staff absence. You're not going to send kids home. You're going to use that teacher to maintain them within school. So over this last period particularly, um, a lot of that resource will have been used um, keeping the show on the road, effectively. So yes, I would agree. Thanks. Um, my main line of questioning is probably going back to an earlier point. Um, Jim Thewis had said you know, there's 32 different models across the country. Um, I'm particularly concerned for rural schools. Um, I think often <clears throat> there aren't the same suite of options available to head teachers uh, or even to, to local authorities. Um, and I just wondered whether you recognise that as a challenge you know, by, by going down this, this route, that there aren't the same you know, third sector providers, there aren't the same opportunities on schools' doorsteps. Um, and often these smaller schools have you know, a smaller PEF budget and therefore less flexibility. Yeah, kind of two points to, to make in response to that. You know, the, 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 the challenges associated with staffing in rural schools per se is a challenge, and we know that. But uh, the whole notion of the cost of the school day and rural poverty attached to this cost of the school day is a point well made. And again, it comes back to the flexibility and the use of additionality in terms of funding within the, the, the school sector. I think what we really do need to look at uh, in a bit more detail is the whole notion, as you say, of rural poverty. And lots of it is hidden, lots of it is misunderstood, and lots of it just does not get addressed. And young people miss out on opportunities on account of no fault of their own, just through the rurality of where they exist and the kind of ethos within that, that, that environment. I think it's something which is not picked up particularly well in the report, and it needs to be something I've put down here, bits and pieces of refinement. It's one of the bits of refinement I think we've got to look at, very definitely so. Is that something any of the other uh, witnesses uh, recognise and see? I mean, I think particularly in, in terms of uh, head teachers, obviously, if you've got a small PEF budget um, and you know, there, there, are limited, you know, there, there are limited resources to, to tap into within you know, the, the immediate community, you know, does that prevent the policy working as well as it, as it might? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of parts to that, as Jim was saying. So you've got the rurality aspect and you've got the budget size part of it. Something that we argued for when PEF first came out was the ability to um, think strategically over a, a slightly longer period. So maybe roll two years of PEF funding together to enable you, if you're in one of these situations where you have a very small PEF fund, to be able to, to purchase an intervention in the second year. Say. So that, that's a, an element of a solution to that for those with the small levels of funding. But I do hear from members in rural areas, if you're in the wilds of um, Dumfries and Galloway, say, or Aberdeenshire or um, the islands, you may have a reasonable level of funding um, and you may have identified that what the intervention you want to, to have is a play therapist, but you wouldn't be able to get one for love nor money because that resource isn't available within your area. So there is a rurality dimension as well as the challenge around about um, those with smaller um, um, allocations. 
and and, and what impact they can make in, in one year with those. Yeah. Um, and a final question. I uh, just w w was just there's a small. Over. Oh, sorry. Um, both um, sorry. Andrea and Mike wanted also okay. to answer your question. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think I think what you're describing, um, Mr. Mundell, is is another kind of like facet of the kind of like dichotomy of of SAC funding. On the one hand, it is very welcome, of course. You know, additional funding to schools help to address the impact of poverty is absolutely welcome. But I think that I think that that in lieu of sufficient core funding that takes account of the you know the, the the circumstances of schools, including the rurality, and um, that that's the problem. You know that's the problem with it. That when you have it in lieu of um, sufficient, um, you know, global funding, um, that would take account of things like the the geographical context, the numbers of children with additional support needs, and so on. But because we have it almost as a not as an instead of, but but in some way, as an instead of, I think I think that we that we encounter difficulties, um, um, you know, along the lines that you're describing. And I think that the other thing about living in a rural area is that the cost of interventions, in in many cases, is going to be higher. So to use the same to use the same kind of like formula to direct funding to to children in rural areas. May, be, may also be something that is inherently flawed because it doesn't take account of the additional costs that there are in getting services, people, um, you know, even travel out of rural areas if you wanted to take young people um, into, um, you know, learning experiences in, in environments out with their own communities. So I think that there's a, there's a, there are some additional costs that are perhaps not being considered. Um, around addressing the impact of poverty in rural areas, and that's maybe something for future funding formula to, you know, to, to factor in. Hi, uh, yeah, um, just not not to repeat what others have said, but I do think this uh, almost touches on a point that came up in a previous <coughs> education committee about the the digital divide, because. Um, the, the new way of, of working, perhaps for some uh, rural schools, opens up at least the possibility of having access to some services and, and advice um, remotely. Uh, but the evidence that's been heard by the committee uh, before suggests that there have been huge problems with network connections, etc., uh, and access to, to remote learning. And the same would apply even where you're trying to access uh, experts, perhaps. Perhaps remotely. Um, so that that point about the digital divide, I think it, it really is reinforced by by what you're suggesting, Mr. Mundell. Hi, thank you. That, that that's uh, all uh, very helpful. The, the last thing I wanted to ask was was about the small group of schools, and it has got smaller again, uh, who who don't receive any PEF funding at all. Um, and you know, I, I mean, I'm personally not convinced when I look at the list of schools, uh, you know, that there will be no young people uh, at those. Uh, who are in poverty, and it's just you know whether uh, you know the policy can be fully fully effective when there are some head teachers in some schools, um, you know many of which are small rural schools, uh, you know who receive no no PEF funding at all. Um, I, I guess uh, you know Greg, Greg uh, or, or Jim would be best placed. Probably. Uh, thanks, Mr. Rundell. And it comes back to a point which I made earlier on, and which Andrea touched on as well, and it's to do with base funding within schools and the level of support through teaching staff within schools that is available across the country. If we're going to look at additionality, I think the point that you make that we become a wee bit more sophisticated in the way in which we devise the level of additionality into schools is something that we can look at now moving on from where we are with this. We are in a better place than we were five years or so ago. We have learned an awful lot about this. And the sort of discussion that we're having this morning is very much related to taking it on to the next stage. If the next stage looks at additionality and a more sophisticated way of identifying the level of additionality which comes to schools, bearing in mind the, the, the discussion we've just had, that will help. But the whole notion of basic staffing formula and basic minimum funding is abso absolutely fundamental if we're going to deliver equity in relation to the level of deprivation which exists within individual schools. Thank you. I, I would uh, agree with absolutely everything that Jim has just said there. Um, 
the the mechanism for distribution of PEF is clearly through using um, a free meal entitlement, and that becomes less and less usable um, as there's more and more of the primary school that receives universal uh, free meals. So there isn't uh, the same information on claimants. So the the accuracy if we accept that distribution on the basis of free meals is correct, which I don't think any of us would say is perfect, but that's the mechanism that we have, it's becoming less accurate as time goes by. Okay. Um, and do you think the very, very last question, do you think the, the use of, of, of low-income households, uh, which has obviously uh, you know, been used elsewhere in Scottish Government policy now, uh, would, would, would be a potential uh, replacement uh, because again, uh, you know that, that certainly appears to pick up uh, more poverty in, in rural areas. I saw Andrea this nodding is, as well. I don't know if that was. Uh, this is. I see my microphone still on, so I'll briefly chip in on that first, if that's okay. The, um, there's a lot of work being done looking at what the best mechanism would be for distribution of these funds, and it goes right through the education system. To looking at widening and access in uh, tertiary education and what um, mechanisms should be used to identify the, the poverty-related group that, that uh, is trying to be tackled. Um, and it seems that none of them are perfect. All of them have uh, different shortcomings. But I think that while preschool meals was probably um, the best sort of proxy that we had at the outset of pupil equity funding, it, um, my point is that it's becoming less uh, likely to be the best proxy. So I'm not sure exactly what other mechanisms you were referring to there, whether it's SIMD or something else, but I do think that that does need to be re-examined. It does create problems then, because you'd be talking about a transition from one mechanism of, for identifying who gets a finite pot of resource to another. Um, and Schools have been promised uh, the long-term stability of the funding that they're receiving at the moment. So that might not be something that would be able to be delivered immediately unless it was accompanied by a further injection of resource so that those schools who had already started their planning based on money they were expecting uh, wouldn't see that disappear uh, when they've committed to staffing and contracts and so on. And Andrea Bradley. Yeah, so I took it from Mr Mundell's question that he was concerned about some young people in schools being excluded from the PEF um, allocation, so we wouldn't at all be looking at anything that, you know, that would result in any detriment for other schools, other school communities and the young people within them. But I do think that there are more sophisticated measures that we could be looking to use, um, aside from free school meals and SIMD, both of which we, we've known to be um, a bit shaky. Um, as, and we, we've Sort of like repeatedly um, suggested that to, um, to, to Scottish Government over the years, um, but there seems to have been a difficulty in um, data being shared by the UK Government that would have the information about family income levels and the Scottish Government and local authorities. There hasn't been the, the triangulation in place that would be required to get measures that are more um, sort of like closely linked to actual family incomes, and of course we know that poverty is about you know levels of levels of or insufficient uh, levels of, of family income. But there, there could be, I think, measures that would be much more um, accurate um, reflections of of of, of need, and um, you know that that then leading to to um, l larger numbers of young people being entitled to allocations of pay money, and that that I think could be a solution to, to what you're describing in some of those rural communities. Thank you. Bob Doris. Um, thank you, convener. I wanted to look at evaluation of PEF, but actually I was struck by something uh, Jim Seelis said at the start about the need for a longitudinal study in relation to uh, how, how the impact of PEF over a number of years. I think it's something that I've raised the committee before, and I know the convener mentioned this morning. Give two encouraging statistics, if you like, Jim. So this year, there was a record high positive destinations from secondary schools, quite outstanding given everything we've been through with COVID. Now, the hard work for that, of course, will have been this year, but a lot of that work will have been 
in previous years getting young people ready for the, the wider world yeah. and the world of work. And we're, don't, we're not very good at measuring that. Also, before lockdown started, um, the two years beforehand, we saw literacy up 3.1% and numeracy up 2.7%. But again, that's a two-year snapshot in time. And it's in for that longer-term research and devaluation. I'd been to this, you know, briefly, if that's OK, briefly than my question, perhaps, Jim, but briefly about what such research might look like. Should it follow a cohort of students over their school career? Should that a little bit more about that, because I think if we're making recommendations in relation to this over a longer period of time, we'd like to better understand the, what a robust research process would look like. Yeah. Two parts, to, two parts to answer that question. The latter part you touched on there just at the end. And I think it would be useful to have you know, a longitudinal study following a cohort of young people. And I think that will give some sort of understanding of the process of Funded, funding targeted at need, and that will give you that kind of long, the longitudinal process. What we also must do is start to have a look at the kind of strategies which are being put into school and let them run and support them over a longitudinal period of time to get an understanding of what works, what works well, what could work better and what doesn't work. And that will give some sort of kind of level of confidence within to the school to know that if we're going to start off on a strategy, we're not going to bail out of it because the funding's not going to be there. But what we are obliged to do is track it through and look at it the way in which it is operating and perhaps not operating quite as well. So a kind of two stream thing, follow a core of young people, but follow the processes to see how the processes are evolving and developing and supporting. Are something we can consider as a committee, so, so thank you for that. But the more I think about evaluation in the short term, from the discussion we've had this morning, you embed evaluation in the planning process yes. from, from day one, of course. Much of the chat this morning has been about what that planning process should look like, how teachers should be involved, how carers should be involved, how parents should be involved, how the wider community should be involved. I note that the refresh of the attainment challenge was announced in November 21, with associated documents being published in March this year and in that guidance it's pretty explicit in relation to the kind of things that should happen within that planning process. It goes as far as to talk about almost a participatory budgeting process with with everyone, what that wider community having their say. I'm unsure whether that happened already in some areas or whether that will happen now more consistently across the country. And of course if we're planning for next term, that planning should already have started, and these revised guidance came out in March this year. So I'm just wondering what, when will witnesses think schools will be able to take account of that refresh guidance and put that refresh guidance into practice? I'm wondering maybe if Greg Dempster maybe could start, start off the reply to that. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there with your, your analysis. That guidance was um, too late in many cases to influence planning for the period that we're now in. So it would be next year or some where that would happen. But the spirit of it, the nature of it, I think you would see represented in, in a lot of the work that was, was ongoing already. But again, that would come back, it would depend on um, the, the levels of PEF available, um, whether there were programmes that had been agreed a couple of years ago, a number of years ago that were carrying on, um, they might not be revisited in that sense. So. Um, I would say that next year would be when you would hope to start to see that guidance uniformly um, uh, in practice. Okay, um, that, that's helpful. I'm just wondering from maybe a, an employee's or, a, or an educationalist perspective, of course, your educationalist, Mr. Debs, but from like a classroom teacher perspective, what the unions think about that um, planning process and the new guidance. Andrea Bradley, has there been any discussions so far? at a local authority level with VIS, for example, about how that refresh guidance could uh, engage teachers more within that planning process? Well, uh, as, you, as you point out, uh, Mr Doris, the, um, the, new, the new framework was launched, I think it was the 30th of March, and the school holidays were hot on the heels of that, so there has been virtually no time 
for any discussion at local authority level about it. And indeed, um, no, no time for the EIS committees to consider that guidance, to put guidance out to members, etc., around what they should be looking to get out of any engagement around it. But that's definitely something you know that we that we intend uh, to do. And um, on the on the um, point about participatory budgeting, we we know from um, some research work that, that that some of our members have done in this area that that kind of model has been adopted in some school communities and seems to have been pretty impactful. So it's good to see, um, you know, that that is going to be the. Um, you know the basis of of um, development of the of, of the next phase of the the, the SAC program, um, but Greg's absolutely right about timescales, because because um, SAC is new to twenty three local authorities. Um, and all of the staff within those local authorities, there's going to have to be quite a sizable piece around professional learning um, that, that so far, I would say, has been has been missing. And it maybe goes back to some of the points that were raised earlier in the discussion about how head teachers um, have felt supported to you know to handle the pack, sorry, the the, the PEF funding, how um, they've been able to work with the the, the teachers within their, their schools. Around it, and, and I think that there's a big piece around professional learning there that, that you know that needs to be considered. It's some that's some that was among the feedback that that I was giving on behalf of the EIS to the civil servants who were developing the framework that there needed to be much more about teachers and about teacher involvement um, in in SAC and PEF and um, more provision made for them to understand what it's all about. You know, reflect on what it means. Talk to colleagues, collaborate with colleagues, and then do the professional learning uh, piece around, you know, around the processes. And um, so there's a there's a gap there that I think will have to be um, quite quickly um, considered and and provision put in place. If even by next year, as Greg suggests, the, the system is going to be ready to take the ball and run with it. That's very helpful, Andrea. And of course, the the, the nine authorities that were ready attainment challenged local authorities will have developed a, a degree of expertise, which hopefully could be shared across wider local authorities. I'm just wondering, Mike Corbett, I take on board absolutely the point that's been made about this guidance is literally just out and we're at the exam diets, particularly for secondary schools. Um, but I'm just wondering, Mike, when you would anticipate those conversations starting to happen uh, at, a, at a school level, you know, a couple of in-service days before uh, the, the, the summer break, uh, early in August. And maybe a, a second follow-up question. If there are sizable decisions being made at the moment, and there may not be, uh, Mr Corbett, and how this f these funds should be spent, would it be better to maybe have some interim provision for the next few months, perhaps, say, to Christmas, to give the time to engage with teachers for a more fundamental, uh, effective and systematic rollout of PEF funding that does engage fully with teachers and with parents and with carers. So would it make sense to have those conversations as soon as possible and maybe hold off some of those decisions and how that money is spent to get it right rather than rush to spend the money for August? Yeah, just, I mean, I think the first thing I would have to say is, is to remind everyone that uh, we are still in a pandemic. We had record absence levels of just last term, as well as many pupils. Um, so, you know, many staff are, are absolutely not in a position right now uh, to be engaging with this. Having said that, I think whether it's it's reasonable for this to happen this term, I, I really don't think it is. I think this is more a medium term plan would be to try and work in what are already existing mechanisms in schools, where there is discussion about school improvement plans and working time agreements. Um, and this kind of discussion could then perhaps become a part of that, which does, of course, tend to happen in this coming term um, and, and involves planning for the coming year. But I think it would be unlikely uh, that that's realistically going to happen right now. And some, some kind of you know interim approach might be useful. Just a couple of other quick things to touch on, um, on you know, building on Andrea's point about uh, professional learning. That survey, that snapshot survey that I talked about earlier, and um, seventy-two percent of our members who responded said that they'd not received any training on how to support pupils with poverty-related issues. Therefore, again, you know that is maybe the point that, that that is important to make before we get into making decisions about how that funding is used. 
Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Mike Corbett. Going to indulge the convener, I've been given permission for a, a brief final question. I thought in the revised guidance it was very helpful that uh, a report should be given to parent councils at the end of each year uh, in relation to being pretty clear in what uh, PEF has or hasn't achieved within that academic year, but also as part of the process of refreshing and changing each year. Uh, Greg Dempster, maybe I'll just bring you in for this final question. Has some of that been happening already? Is there an annual trawl within parent councils about that, that, that direct engagement? Is this just affirming good practice, or is it patchwork across the country? Convener, I also see that Mr Thewlis would like in, I'm sure very briefly, of course, Mr Dempster, and hopefully with the indulgence of the convener, Mr Thewlis... I, I, again, it would be mixed practice, I'm sure, on that point, um, and I think it would be affirming best practice, uh, as you say. Okay, thank you. No, I will try and be brief. Uh, coming back to the, the original point that which you raised, Mr Doris, in relation to how much of this is going on with the schools within schools just now, some of it is in some areas. Lots of the areas it's not. But to, to come back to this, uh, the, the whole notion of the way in which uh, this, this report sits in the way in which it is taken forward. One of two things to, to bring to this. Schools at the moment will be involved in their improvement planning review and taking forward improvement planning for next year. And it's impossible to separate recovery from where schools are within this, and that will sit within school improvement planning. That's not to suggest for a moment that everything else gets ignored. Everything else gets taken forward within the context of recovery within a school improvement plan. But we start to look at what is outlined within this report and the way in which it's suggested it's taken forward. Could I presume to suggest that there are one or two really quite useful tools within this to enable schools to start to meld that into where they are, given their position just now, and given the recovery process which they're going through? Now, the whole notion of having stretch aims there and stretch aims which are agreed with the, within the local community, not just with the local authority people, but with the, the various other uh, agencies within the community, very, very useful in taking schools from where they are within this process to another place and going forward. The three-year funding part of this, absolutely fundamental to the way in which this is taken forward. The, the kind of insistence on the notion of collegiality and you know, it's been picked up in several contexts earlier on, the whole notion of collegiality. And I would presume to suggest that the, the level of collegiality at school level is significantly greater than the level of collegiality between schools and local authority, and that needs to be worked upon. But the whole notion of having logic model and the various aspects, various iterations of the logic model included within this gives a focus and a structure to take that forward. So to kind of answer your question, we've got to start somewhere and start sometime. We are at that kind of point in time just now, and it will be for schools and local authorities to find their way through and into this process based on the tools and the structures which are there. But there are kind of three keys here which we can't move away from, which will always be there, and we don't address in the first instance we're not going to get to. The first is, this is suggesting that we need to have a change in culture. For some schools, some local authorities, a significant change in culture. We've got to become more attuned to understanding the barriers which are there. Why is poverty making learning difficult for young people? And we've got to become much more clever, and we've touched on this, but now we're going into the whole notion you picked up earlier on, on the use of data, and the use of data in the way in which we start to make decisions and monitor the decisions which will be made in relation to the outcomes which we want to have. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ross Greer. Stick with this point around um, evaluation. I'm interested in any uh, examples of local good practice. You've got there's been a number of uh, anecdotal examples mentioned this morning of good practice in terms of deployment of the funds, but I'm really interested to know if there are, whether it is schools, clusters, local authorities, or even RECs, anywhere that any of our panel witnesses are aware of that you think is already doing a really good job of local evaluation that you could point us towards? Because uh, I think that would be of considerable interest to the committee if we can see an example of, of successful evaluation in practice. Um, and I wonder if I could start with Jim on that one. Uh, thanks, Mr. Uh, there are, as we've said already, kind of anecdotal examples of what is going on out there within schools. And certainly from my point of view, if the committee is interested, as I assume it is, in picking up on these examples, I'll be more than happy to come to you with examples of monitoring, tracking, 
target setting, the way in which we support young people within the home environment, all sorts of aspects of that. So I'm more than happy to engage with the committee through my professional association on the night, and I would imagine my three colleagues will be in exactly the same position. Thanks very much. Certainly very grateful uh, for that. Does anybody, Greg, Mike or Andrea, have any specific examples that you'd like to provide this morning? Andrea? So, um, I, I can't really account for the, you know, the efficacy of um, you know, the, the various modes of evaluation that have been cited to us, but they are varied, and, and I suppose to some extent they vary according to the kinds of interventions that have been put in place. But our members have reported things like um, you know, just using established quality assurance processes with a particular focus on equity, you know, in some elements of those. They've talked about tests of change. They've talked about, as Jim has just done, um, you know, specific pupil tracking, um, including using systems that enable drill down to relevant individual qualitative data, um, attendance figures, benchmarking assessments for, for literacy and numeracy, maybe at the beginning, midway point and end point of certain interventions around literacy and numeracy, and in some cases, SNSA data is being used uh, to evaluate the, the efficacy of, of you know, different interventions that have been, that have been put in place. Um, but I, I would say that, that that's an area also that, that requires um, some professional learning input for teachers, possibly for head teachers. Um, and the other thing that I would say about the whole kind of evaluation measurement piece is that we need to be careful that, um, I think it was touched upon a bit earlier too, that we don't go for interventions and approaches that are easily measurable um, in, a, a, at the expense of maybe ones that are more complex, harder to measure the outcomes of. Um, you know, we're, 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 there's a danger of simplicity and reductionism rather than doing things that are going to be longer term impactful if we simply look for things that are easily easily measurable. Um, and and that, that's been a message that the EIS has given consistently with regards to the attainment challenge, PEF spending, um, etc. And the other thing that we would like to see feature in the evaluation piece, whether that be short, medium or long term, is the voice of teachers. You know, the, the the voice of teachers, qualitative data, um, in addition to quantitative data, um, and 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 for that to be over, you know, we were talking about longitudinal um, evidence gathering, you know, for that to feature within that kind of evidence gathering as well. Thanks very much. I believe Mike Corbett's also looking to, to come in. Just before I bring him in, though, Andrew, you mentioned um, again there what you said just at the start of the session about the, the difference between uh, attainment and achievement, and making sure that we're getting those wider measures uh, of, of achievement right. Uh, just uh, Again, kind of on that same theme of what I asked a, a moment ago, are you aware of, of anywhere, any local authorities, for example, who are trying to take that more rounded uh, achievement-based uh, approach, or are we, is it still a pretty consistent picture in the country insofar as we are consistently too narrowly looking at just attainment? I'm not aware of individual local authorities having made specific strategic decisions with regards to those things, but again, I do know that anecdotally good things are happening. So, for example, um, you know, in some school communities, the, the measures of participation are being used. Um, so it's not just about young people's attendance at school, it's about the their attendance at school and the I suppose the the, the, the way that they're interacting with, with their peers, with the learning experiences that are being um, designed for them and so on. Um, but I don't have hard and fast examples from individual local authority areas, um, Ross, sorry. Thanks very much. And uh, before I bring Mike in, I don't think I mentioned at the last committee meeting, but uh, Mr Corbett was my English teacher. So if any colleagues have complaints about my approach to Scottish education, you can, you can take it up with him after this session. Uh, yeah, and on, on that point, Mike, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, thanks for that, Ross. Uh, <laughs> um, just to really re-emphasise, I think, much of what uh, Andrea was saying about what we're measuring, because as, as has been pointed out early on, um, the focus on attainment really is too narrow. Um, that should be broadened, but it can be very difficult to measure some of the things. Uh, you know, for example, we've got a, we're, we're rightly looking at focusing on the four capacities more of CFE, but I mean, how do, how do you measure how a child has become a more effective contributor? It's a really difficult thing to do. So that needs to be borne in mind, particularly. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that you know, are we are we gathering enough of the right data in the first place? 
I am aware of a, a contribution to a recent cross-party group on challenging racial and religious prejudice, um, where the point was made that there is simply a lack of data currently being collected for some groups, um, particularly black and Afro-Caribbean pupils. So we really need to bear that in mind as well, that we are collecting um, the right data across all areas, but the focus not just to be on the most easily, easily measurable data, I think, and look at these broader themes. Thanks. I've got one final question. I suppose it's a bit of a, a two-parter. And just going back to um, Bob's line of question there about the, the new guidance around annual reporting to parent councils, for example, but also the, the questions that he raised around longitudinal studies, which I think is, is really Im important. So on one level, I, I think it's a really good idea to make sure that there is that clear expectation of local accountability through, for example, those annual uh, reports. But there's a bit of me that's concerned that that then creates an expectation that you can and should be able to measure the impact of some of this stuff within a year, whereas we've spent quite a lot this morning talking about the fact that whether it's a year or even an, indeed an entire parliamentary term, you cannot close the poverty-related attainment gap in such a, a short period of time. So I'd be interested in your reflections on how we get that balance right between making sure that there is robust local accountability but not creating unrealistic expectations, whether it's with parents or local authority level or indeed parliament and, and nationally. Um, but I'm also interested in your thoughts on where responsibility for longitudinal studies should lie with this. Is this something that schools, clusters, local authorities, RICs, or nationally, Education Scotland, or even the government directly should be doing? What, what's the, the most appropriate place at which uh, to be organising something like a longitudinal evaluation? Um, and again, if we could start with, with Jim on both of those. Yeah, yeah thanks, Mr Gear. Uh, perhaps to answer the first question is a wee bit more easy to answer, and it's to do with the reporting to to parent councils. I think we'll be careful here to use some of the structures and some of the systems which are already within schools. And the relationship which the school has with its parents council exists in that sort of reporting and that sort of level of discussion in relation to what the school is going to be doing and what the school has been doing and what the school has been achieving on a much more kind of fine grained way exists within schools just now. And I think, you know, to, to have it in that sort of a way and formalise the wee bit is o only to the good. But I think what we've got to look at uh, and put this within, to, uh, within another context is the education reform agenda and Professor Muir's report and the way in which that then sits in relation to what we do in terms of attainment, achievement, the assessment of progress, the evaluation of progress and young people's school experience. And if we start to then look at the agencies, the national agencies which are there, and align them with the sort of level of discussion and thinking that we've had this morning, we've got a much greater chance of looking at things which are operate in a kind of an air of mutuality. They are nested and they are aligned, so that we don't have a report for the parent council, a report for the local authority, a report for. The inspectors, the inspectors come along, they report for Scottish Government. There is a huge opportunity which exists, and it sits out with the kind of context of this specific discussion in relation to the way in which we review and evaluate all aspects of progress within Scottish education. And if we are to miss that, bearing in mind what Professor Muir, Muir's report has said, I think it would be absolutely negligent at the highest level on us all if we missed that opportunity. Thanks very much. And just on that, the second part around responsibility for the longitudinal work around this, I mean, obviously we could do a study nationally, Education Scotland could be responsible for it, but are there levels beneath that that you think it would be appropriate well, to again, do? Sorry, I missed out on the, the earlier part of, you know, work, work with what is already there. There are quality assurance processes which mm. exist within local authorities just now. They are well used. Everybody understands how to do that. What we have got to do, as I said, is look at Largely within the report, there is a, a bit within the report that says you know, we do not give the system more work to do on account of producing more reports. What we use with is what is within the system just now to make sure that the information gets to the correct, in the correct way to the correct people to start to make more policy decisions which are more meaningful. Part of the discussion we have had this morning is in relation to what is the next stage of what we are going to be talking about that we have been talking about this morning. 
So that information is information which is useful and useful in the context of supporting young people's learning, but also in the wider context of supporting what happens at local at school level, local authority level, national level. Let's start to align the system as opposed to having it in different chunks reporting at different times to different people. We are much better at that than we were in the past. But the reform report gives us a much clearer opportunity to take that forward now. Thanks, Arch. That was really useful. And I believe Greg Dempster is looking to come in on this as well. Yeah, I, I think Jim's point around about having the different parts of reporting nested and aligned is extremely important because um, you could create a, a bureaucratic nightmare for school leaders around about um, creating reports for multiple different audiences. So, so that point is, is very important. In terms of your question around about a longitudinal study, I think that clearly at the national level, whether that's Education Scotland or probably Education Scotland or the inspector aspect there, um, there is a role there to take a longitudinal approach. Um, and that's relevant for the systematic design or evolution of the attainment challenge and the, the PEF funding approach. Um, but also, as Jim was talking about, there are tried and tested systems within school and local authority levels around about quality improvement, which should take a longitudinal approach, which should inform that study, as it were. Um, I think that there are things within the, the um, attainment challenge just now that are a little bit problematic in that, and that's the, the repeated determination that we should be accelerating progress and, and the language about reporting success of interventions. I think there needs to be more of a sort of black box, box approach where um, we, we accept where we are. Uh, we want to get back on track of an improving picture, which is where we were starting to get to, but not every intervention will be successful. And there needs to be a climate in which people can say, we tried that and that didn't work for us. And that's as valuable to be shared as the successes. Thanks very much. I believe Andrea and then Mike Rokin to come in. I'm conscious I'm probably eating into colleagues' time at this point, though, so if you don't mind me asking you to be brief in your responses. Okay, I'll try to be very quick. So I think you had three questions. The first one was about maybe something about the behaviours that might be encouraged by the expectations of annual reporting, you know, an expectation that you'll be reporting year-on-year -year success. And there needs to be a realism that that is not how it's going to look. This is not going to be linear progress, particularly not when we take into account the wider societal factors that impact on young people's um, you know, life in school and so on. And we've just had two years of a pandemic that's really derailed um, you know, so much of the, you know, the, the kind of like trajectory towards um, more equitable outcomes. Um, so, so there needs to be a realism about it. Absolutely agree with colleagues that, that whatever reporting mechanisms are put in place need to be bureaucracy light. Otherwise, we will take valuable resources away from the very young people that we're trying to that we're trying to help and support. So that's absolutely crucial. And on the point about longitudinal um, evidence gathering and data and evaluation, I think that that could be something, as Greg suggested, that sits with um, either the, the agency that's going to replace Education Scotland possibly the inspector, but I don't know. It depends how that evolves. It depends how the, 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 the inspection kind of like regime involves. I'm not sure that the culture of that would be quite right for this. Or we could look to have um, independent academic research um, established over, a, over a, a long period of time, you know, to look objectively across a range of evidence bases um, and to, to report into um, all actors, actually, um, you know, who are part of this endeavour, not solely um, Scottish Government. Thanks very much. And Mike? Yeah, just very briefly then, yeah. I mean, the, the Parental Council reports, um, let's focus on activities undertaken rather than, you know, get bound up with the percentages who've passed, you know, SNSAs, etc. cetera. Um, and yeah, absolutely avoid bureaucracy, but we need to avoid that just in case culture that, that has developed too often, um, particularly around inspections, right? But we'll need to do this just in case. And there's a danger of that coming in here as well. Well, we, we need this additional bureaucracy just in case someone asks us how we've spent the money and we need to justify ourselves. Um, and that touches on, on Greg's point. We need to allow the confidence here to make mistakes for people to have well-intentioned 
um, well-researched ideas that maybe in practice just don't work in the end. And let's have some openness and honesty about that so that we don't have that just-in-case culture. Um, and absolutely, I think, uh, let's have some you know, external independent uh, research as part of this, as long as it's not too bureaucratic. And I don't know, uh, like others, if uh, I certainly uh, wouldn't be rushing to, to give uh, a job on this to Education Scotland or the current inspection regime. So let's uh, see what the, the newer uh, regimes there look like before I think we'd be confident to say we, we trust them with that kind of work. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Ross. Um, Michael Marr. Th thanks, Convener. Uh, I want to talk about the and uh, maybe get your views on the shift away from challenge authority areas uh, where poverty is deepest to the more general allocation of funding uh, across Scotland. I mean, that change is already having very significant and difficult consequences for some of the previous challenge authorities. Um, but in my view, it's also a significant departure from what was a settled Scottish understanding of the particular challenges of communities that face severe multiple deprivation. Um, so can you explain the rationale as you understand that for this departure from a focus on the deepest poverty. Um, and can I start with Andrea, please? So, um, from, the, from the early beginnings of the attainment challenge, the EIS had some issues with the, with the way that funding was being distributed. Um, we understand that school communities that, uh, or, and agree actually, that school communities that experience um, higher rates of poverty and higher levels then of the associated deprivations require additional funding. Um, but um, to, to do something to, to, to organise the funding in such a in such a blunt way in the first instance we thought was was problematic because it kind of supposed that poverty didn't exist in um, other parts of Scotland and we know that. Um, it exists in every single local authority, every single school community. Um, so it's quite right. We feel that there has been a, a reframing of the, you know, the, 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 the attainment challenge to take greater account of that. So that's a good thing about it. But we have been absolutely, um, I have to say, appalled actually at the, the levels of funding cuts to um, six of the original nine challenge authorities. It is. It, it beggars belief to us um, as to why those cuts would be made um, at a time when we know that poverty levels are rising, where the, the pandemic has absolutely bludgeoned some, some communities, um, and we know that the individual families and the young people within those families are struggling as a result of COVID. The um, Scottish um, Poverty and Inequality Commission has reported to the Scottish Government that it is in danger of missing the interim child poverty targets and the 2030 child poverty targets. So we do not see it that cuts in communities that have disproportionately high levels of poverty and deprivation make any kind of sense whatsoever. We agree that the money should be distributed across all 32 local authorities. Um, but we don't see it that that should be the expense of um, budgets um, that were being dispersed to authorities that were originally considered to be in um, additionally high need of additional additional support. And so that, that that's a part of it that has really vexed our members and that we've discussed a lot with Scottish government and civil servants. And, and can I ask what what the response to that has been, Andrea? So I mean, what what is the rationale you've had back? Because you know, those I, I really do share those concerns of your members in terms of the cuts that are for the, the poorest people in some of the poorest communities in the country. So, what what has the justification been? Because I've not heard one. It's 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 been it's been simply that there's a, a fixed amount of money, and in order to make that money go um, across all 32 local authorities, some um, are going to have to you know to, to take a hit basically. Um, and you know, for some of those lo local authorities, you're talking, you know, click manager, 62% funding cut over over four years. Dundee, 74%. East Ayrshire, 61%. Inverclyde, 78%. And even Glasgow. Um, okay, um, of those local authorities, the least uh, sizable cut at 10%. But you've got so many communities in Glasgow where more than one in two children um, are, are living in poverty. So it just it doesn't make it, you know it's to us to us that is very very problematic yeah. about the new. Um, you know the new arrangements for for the attainment challenge funding. 
Greg uh, Dempster, I can ask you, I mean, we've talked a lot about additionality, but for many, these are very serious cuts for the poorest communities. In your discussions with government, have you had a better, a more comprehensible justification for this action? No, I think that Andrea has said it all there, really, um, that, that, that she's rehearsed all of the issues there quite fully. I think that the, the um, argument has been that there needs to be a more structured approach to supporting the use of the attainment challenge across the 32 authorities. But it, it, it is, um, on one hand, you've got smoothing of PEF allocations where schools would have not been uh, given any more than a 10% cut to the resource if there has been a change in their uh, demographic within their school. But there isn't the similar smoothing with the attainment challenge funding. So um, th there's quite a difference in approach there. Okay. Um, uh, can I ask Jim Thulis, me and Mr Thulis, in your previous, you were a head teacher in Dundee for, for many years. It's a, a local authority you know very well and the challenges that are there. Um, 20 years at Harris Academy, I believe. Is, um, and so it's a, my figure is a 79% cut for Dundee, um, about 100 staff across uh, these schools. Can you imagine how Dundee is going to cope with that? I agree entirely with everything that Andrea and Greg has said. And to answer your question directly, no. Yeah. It's, I mean, the, the significant uh, context of that, I think, is for Dundee pupils. Yeah. Um, it, it's for, to have that um, on the record from Mr Thulis and his experience in Dundee, I think, is, is really important. Uh, Mike Corbett, your reflections on the same, please. Just very, very simply, Mr Mara, uh, it's absolutely right in principle to, to broaden the approach you know, as has been touched on earlier, for example, because of uh, rural poverty. Um, but, you know, why there has not been some effort to, to have some transitional funding or transitional arrangement um, for the nine authorities, I, I cannot fathom, because it, it's clearly not right to be making those swinging cuts that you're talking about, and that will certainly have a, a negative impact in those areas. Okay. And if it can come on, uh, it can be a to the issue of then of additionality, um, because again, if, if, if I can, I think we just wanted to come in on that. Oh, please, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, convener. Just just while we're on the, um, the, the that that refreshed approach, I mean, I think all of us would recognise that there's there's poverty everywhere, and certainly my uh, colleague Oliver Mandel made some good points about um, poverty being in rural areas and not just urban areas. But the timing of the change. Um, is hugely difficult for the um, nine challenge authorities. I think it's widely acknowledged that um, more deprived areas have been affected the most by the pandemic and, and, and the impacts of that. I suppose my question would be, if we are operating within, uh, I should declare an interest, my local authority is, is one of the areas that was a, a, a challenge authority and, and they actually made um, excellent progress. We've spoken a bit about evidence of improvements. Um, Education Scotland 2021 report um, about the Scottish Attainment Challenge said that in North Ayrshire, the attainment in literacy and numeracy between 2016 and 2019 has improved for learners at all stages. And in addition, the pace of improvement of literacy has been faster for children and young people living in the most um, deprived areas. So clearly the work that was being done was helping. I suppose my question would be, if we're operating within a fixed um, budget and we acknowledge that there's, you know, there is poverty everywhere, is there any evidence or any situation that um, would change your position that it should go to all 32 authorities? If, if there's evidence that the, the improvements decrease, for example, should it be changed back and targeted to the areas of, of, of greatest need? Or, um, you know, how do we how do we deal with this um, hugely difficult um, decision? Andrea, if I could come to you first. So, um, I, I think you might be suggesting that um, that where there's been maybe variability 
in terms of the impact of the funding that maybe there should be almost penalties applied? No, 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 I'm, no. Not, I'm not suggesting that for no. a second. I'm, I'm simply acknowledging that there's, there's, there's poverty, poverty everywhere and also that there's a fixed, fixed budget. And I'm saying from my perspective, I see evidence that that targeted assistance to my area that was in great need has made improvements. So if we find that, you know, down the line, by spreading this money across the whole country, those improvements are impacted or, or it's not having, you know, as what, what appears to be a, a great impact, would that change your thinking around whether think the, the, the support should be targeted or, or universal, if you like? That was my question. So I think that what I was trying to say earlier on in this morning's discussion is that I think that there has to be um, sufficient global funding of education, you know, all, all of the things that are, that are necessary, necessary for all young people to have a good experience at school, regardless of the particular needs that they have or the socio-economic socio backgrounds from which they come. And then there will be some additionality required over and above that, given the levels of poverty that there are currently um, in Scotland and, and more widely um, in the UK. Um, so I think that, I think that, I think that we, we absolutely need to see more funding going to all areas. Definitely have to see that. What we would suggest is that it shouldn't be first and foremost through the through the attainment challenge. It should be through um, core national funding to um, you know to all schools, all school communities um, via via local authorities with a, you know with some kind of additional package, perhaps like perhaps like SAC with that very targeted focus on top of that. But at the moment. The problem is that the that the core budgets are are insufficient. Um, I, I I agree that, that the money should be going to all 32 local authorities. You know, we, we, we argued that um, from the outset. You know, we, we think that's a we think that's a positive development in the reframing of all of this. But it's just very very difficult to see how um, across Scotland we're going to continue or, or get back on um, you know get back on track with progress by taking away huge waves of funding from, from those six areas um, you know, where, where, where poverty has been a long-standing issue for a very long time. So as I suppose we see a bit of a, bit of a kind of like conflict um, or, and maybe that, that piece of it kind of undermines what actually is a really good, um, you know, a really good kind of like rethinking of how the money should, should be shared across all 32 local authorities. But what we would argue is that Additional funding could and should have been found to avoid cuts to those to those areas um, in the first place. Thank you, Convener. I can't see if any other panel members wish to uh, Jim. Yeah. yeah, Mike Corbett does. Okay, I think go to Jim first. Oh, Jim. Well, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, notwithstanding the the point and Andrea made about basic core funding, which I'm in, uh, totally aligned with. When we looked at attainment challenge funding in the first place, it was directed towards deprivation, and nine areas of deprivation were picked up there. Surely there, there's in fairness and in terms of equity. We know, we should know, the government statisticians will know the number of young people who were impacted by deprivation within these nine areas. I mean, we've had a discussion round about how we define deprivation, but you know, let's take that there is a, a, a definition there. A reasonably straightforward statistician exercise to look at how much core funding per capita was allocated across these nine areas and reallocate that into the other remaining areas on a per capita basis. In fairness, that makes sure that those young people... You know, I, I know there's a... You know, financial aspect to this, but in fairness to the young people who are in the areas who have been supported in a certain way, it's surely sorry, immoral to take away that funding, allocate it across all the areas on a per capita basis, working out how much was allocated per capita to the nine areas in the first place. Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, I mean, again, if we just step back from uh, the funding here, we've been talking about mainly 
today uh, and we go back to, to those points from our members that I mentioned earlier on about there needing to be more support staff, more teachers, more support, support services in schools, tackle parental unemployment. These are all national things that need to be addressed by improvements and increases in national budgets. Um, and, and not just for education beyond, because we've said it's it's not only down to schools to, to have the ability to, to narrow the, the poverty-related attainment gap. Um, so I think that is vitally important, and we cannot forget about that. Um, but the, the other points we've, has already been mentioned about um, perhaps using better measures to, to target uh, the funding. I think that's important. Um, and I understand the, the point about if if the funding seems to be working better in one area that, than another, you know, potentially you're going to look to, to switch that focus somewhere down the line. But that does again perhaps get away from what I was talking about earlier about giving confidence staff to, to try things and suggest things with the best intentions and feel that they're not going to get penalised if if one of their ideas does not work. But I think we'd have to be very, very cautious. Kavira, yeah, thanks to everyone for those answers. They were helpful. Just, I, I feel I should be really clear. I was not for a second suggesting removing funding where things work. I was suggesting funding should remain where it's been shown to work. That's, that was my point. And I, I would also um, say that I totally agree with Mike in terms of um, teachers and schools being given the space to try things and to fail, because we know there's, there's learning in that too. So it's important to have the, the, the opportunity and um, space to do those things. I think it was Greg that mentioned black box earlier. So okay, Greg, Greg as well. to come yes. in. Um, in answer to your question, Greg. Uh, very briefly, you won't get any of us defending the withdrawal of resource mm -hmm. from um, um, different local authority areas. It's, uh, it's not something that we would support because we would all be looking for greater investment in education across the board. And um, so you wouldn't expect us to say any of that. But I would say that because PEF is distributed and the bulk of the uh, attainment challenge funding is now PEF, and that is distributed on the basis of free school meals, you would expect that it follows that the, the um, authorities that you've referenced would be getting a much higher share than other authorities. And on the face of it, it would seem a more equitable way of distributing the money. That doesn't overcome the fact that it was distributed in a different way and there's been a cliff edge for these authorities. Michael Mara. Yeah. I, I want to focus a little bit on uh, issues of additionality, uh, then, in particular in reference to the pandemic. Some of the panel earlier on were questioning the, a quote from Professor Patterson and what data set that referred to. That referred to the 2018 PISA data. Um, and, uh, but what we know, and that was regarding the decline of more affluent pupils' attainment, um, but what we know is that things have got worse since then given the COVID pandemic. So I'm interested, there's this issue of, I suppose, we've touched on in terms of additionality around cuts to council budgets, you know, cutting parts of the education budget and then backfilling. And Mr Thulis gave some um, examples around that. I'm particularly concerned as to whether we are backfilling the impact of the pandemic now. So we know that things have gotten worse. We also knew, know from the Audit Scotland report that actually progress had been limited up to the pandemic. A billion pounds of Scottish taxpayers' money spent on uh, this activity, and rightly so, but limited progress. Need has increased, but what, where do we find ourselves now? Do we feel that actually the, the measures being taken by the Scottish Government to cope with the impact of the pandemic is sufficient? Because as far as I can see, this is it. The Scottish Attainment Challenge process is the, is the, the allocation of resource. So, can I start with again with Andrea, please? Um, so, in a word, no. We we don't think that the plans that have been put in replace, put in place for recovery are nearly um, realistic or ambitious enough, given the the impacts of the pandemic. Um, even pre-pandemic, we didn't think, as I've said, you know, a, a few times this morning, that SAC was going to be the answer in terms of reducing the poverty-related attainment gap. But what we need to see is significantly greater overall funding in um, education to enable class size reduction, so that teachers can work more closely with individual children, small groups of children, um, do things that are really creative and in the spirit of curriculum for excellence. Um, 
We need more specialist additional support needs provision in classrooms. You know, we, we need it to be on hand in schools so that it can be deployed to classrooms, as well as teachers having additional knowledge and understanding of additional support needs as well. And we also need there to be on hand the range of external agencies that can support young people who have additional needs. So that's CAMS, speech and language therapists, educational psychologists. And sadly, in spite of significantly increased numbers of young people with additional support needs in recent years, we have seen cuts and cuts and cuts to those services year upon year upon year. Um, we need to see teachers with additional class contact, non-class contact time in order that they can think, reflect, collaborate, you know, talk about what works, what doesn't work, um, and actually build strategies to, um, you know, to make the kinds of, um, of like improvements and, and um, provide the kind of support that young people so, so desperately need. Um, and and that's, that's ever more, or all the more um, important, given the, the, the shocks of the pan pandemic and what is needed um, around recovery. And another really, another really sort of like, this seems really basic to us, but there's a big gap just now in the, in the Scottish Government's free school meal policy, whereby it is inclusive of young people from primary one to primary five currently. There's going to be a delay in it being rolled out to primary six and seven, and young people in the secondary sector are completely missing from it. We think that there are things that need to be done urgently now to make sure that all children and young people are not hungry at school and that they can have access to food that is absolutely stigma free. And that seems to us to be a really kind of like basic and obvious thing to have done. After the after the, the you know the, the kind of economic and financial impacts and so you know social impacts of the pandemic, but also now that we've got the you know the kind of spectre of the cost of living crisis um, looming as well, and um, so so there are there are so many things, so many more practical things that that, that could and should be done in the interest of recovery that that, that 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 really would be the foundations. I think should be the foundations from which um, things like SAC and PEF then. Um, emerge, you know, or, 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 or are built upon, but but those things on their own, it's it's too shaky. It's too shaky. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thulis, do, do do we risk sitting here in a few years' time, looking back on this reshaped programme for Scottish Attainment Challenge, closing the attainment gap, saying in actual fact that might have been adequate pre-pandemic, but actually post-pandemic, it wasn't fit for purpose. Um, I'm not so sure about the, the not fit for purpose, but I think we are in a position here where we could have made it better in relation to the way in which it could impact on young people, on their learning and on their health and well-being. And if we're going to put some sort of structure into place, then the structure that we have is attainment funding structure and PEF. That's what the system is accustomed to working with. I think I've made the point on several occasions earlier on this morning that we could become much more upfront and much more kind of in the context of the school environment in the way in which it is allocated and the way in which schools are empowered to use it. We have the discussion that we've had just over the past, the past 10 minutes or so in relation to the, the, the sharing out of what was for nine local authorities into 32 local authorities could should have been done on a much more equitable basis. And if we're going to look at it as a per capita allocation targeted at need, then that could have been done. It would have required more funding. And you know, as I've said, with all four of us have said, it should have, been, it should have been more funding. And the whole notion of PEF allied to that applied at school level. And schools, given the decision within local authority strategic planning, to look at the way in which they address need and the environment in which the head teachers, the school staff know best, we have a much better way of doing this. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that will do me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to return to Ruth McGuire for a follow-up question. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's Willie Rennie. Yeah. Willie um, Rennie. Thanks. Thanks very much. I know we're probably. Time is marching on. Um, I want to get, I mean, I've got a flavour of this already, but I want to really understand what life is like in the classroom just now. We've heard about um, the various pressures, but I think Andrea in particular, and I'd like to address this to her. Um, you know, we've, we're just coming out of the pandemic. Some say we're still in the pandemic. Um, there's significant mental health problems. Um, and then there's also pressure to perform and pressure to perform on 
attainment and closing the attainment gap. Um, I speak to many teachers, but I want to hear from you about what you think life is like in the classroom just now. So we, we've gathered some information from our members quite recently about that, um, and we've, we've had quite a lot of um, quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that young people are struggling with socialisation. There are difficulties in concentrating for sustained periods of time, difficulties listening to peers, to teachers, and to, to, to support staff, difficulties in verbally communicating, um, increased distraction of mobile phones and um, you know digital devices. Um, there seems to be less resilience amongst young people, increased number of behaviour concerns, and this is particularly alarming because of the numbers of very young children who are exhibiting um, you know, challenging behaviour. So this would be young people who have made the transition from, from early years to, to, to primary one. Um, a number of violent incidents um, you know, being reported um, you know, as a result of distressed behaviour in very, very young children. Um, and as, as you've as you've suggested, the mental health crisis growing, um, you know, to, to what it was pre-pandemic, and I think to some extent this will have been the result of um, bereavement. You know, thousands of young people will have experienced bereavement over the course of the, 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 the past two years, and we know that a disproportionate number of those young people will be in will be in communities, you know, where, where levels of poverty um, are high. And of course, we've had for senior phase students. Um, you know the anxiety of um, having to prepare for for an exam diet, at the same time as coping with all of those things or, or many of those things that I've you know that I've outlined um, as being kind of like generally experienced by by young people within within schools. So teachers are, are in addition to teachers, um, I suppose, struggling to maintain education continuity, handle all the mitigations that are, that have been in place in schools. They're seeing that kind of that kind of intensification of need amongst their young people day and daily. So it's been a huge amount that teachers have been contending with and trying to juggle um, over the over the past two years. And it seems that there has not been maybe a firm enough grasp of that amongst decision makers who often have sought to kind of like keep the attainment narrative, you know, the, the attainment drive narrative going um, and all the kind of like business as usual processes and demands um, going. And it's really been quite a it's really been quite a. Um, it's unsustainable. You know that way of working is unsustainable, and there has to be acknowledgement of the need for recovery of all, and that recovery also has to include teachers because they are absolutely critical to the ongoing and longer-term recovery of our children and young people and our education system um, in its entirety. So, and, Andrea, you've, you've highlighted that there seems to be a, a lack of a grasp of um, the competing pressures. Where's that coming from? Who is it? I mean, is it, is it the council? Is it the government? Is it, you know, where, where is that coming from and why don't they get it? I think, it, I think it's been different, different um, organisations at different times. So, for example, towards the end of, um, I think it was the autumn term of 2021, there was the announcement that Education Scotland was going to resume scrutiny activities. So they seemed completely you know, um, cut off and remote from the, the reality in school. Now, to, to their credit, they about turned on that, you know, because of probably the protestations of us and others about the inappropriateness of that. Um, we have had Scottish Government um, maintain its expectation that young people complete um, na national standardised assessments in the midst of in the midst of all this, um, we've had the, the continuing collection of ach achievement of curriculum for excellence uh, levels data. Even the decision to go ahead with an exam diet early on this academic session, without us really knowing the full picture of what COVID was going to do, we could have guessed actually what COVID might have done over the course of this academic session, and not really taking full account of the the, the, the recovery principles that Scottish Government Education Scotland co-authored actually along with you know with input from others. Um, and about the, 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 what, what should have been the primacy of health and well-being um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, so there just seems to have been a lot of kind of maybe collision of policy priorities um, and maybe a lot of um, inconsistency of messaging around what's important at this time and what should be less important at this time. So, so tell me, what do you think the consequences of this, long term, short term, will be? I think I think that I think that to, to to fail to have proper cognizance of the impact of the pandemic on 
children and young people, their families, their communities, on wider society and on the professionals who work with, with young people will be a, a, a huge error of, of, of judgment, a huge error of judgment. I think I think that to I think that we, we all have to understand the magnitude of what has happened, you know, to, to, to Scotland and, and to the world um, over the past over the past couple of years, um, and to understand that even just to fix the damage that has been done by that is going to take a lot of you know a lot of creativity, a lot of collaboration and and additional resource, right? But prior to the onset of the pandemic, we were also trying to emerge from more than a decade of austerity, which had also battered school communities, children and young people and their families. And um, you know, so we hadn't we hadn't even recovered from that decade long um, period of austerity, and then the pandemic, um, you know, came along and, and and dealt a few a few further, well, more than a few further additional um, hefty blows. So, so, so to, to fail to understand that, and to fail to understand that we need to not only um, get back to where we were pre-pandemic, we need to do better than get back to where we were pre-pandemic. We have to think differently, work differently, and resource differently if we're going to make that longer term difference. And if we don't do that, we're going to see all of the impacts of poverty. You know, that we know that young people's health health inequalities that emerge in young people, not just actually later in life, but, but during their, their childhood as well, health inequalities, um, equalities and in, inequalities in terms of criminal justice, in terms of longer term employment, in terms of housing, all of these things we will continue to see um, unless we properly equip the education to, uh, education service to do its part in addressing poverty, but also do all the other things that we need to do in the other parts of society to, to more um, decisively um, tar uh, tackle poverty um, at source. So I don't want to just focus on you, Andrea, and maybe the others will come in in a second, but um, I know you've you've focused on this area. Um, so, do you think that if, if we kind of rush to get back to the way that it was, might result in longer-term mental health, unemployment, criminal activities, the whole range of issues that we know come from um, the the attainment gap, the gap between the wealthy and the less wealthy? Um, you think that will get worse if we rush? To, to try and get back to normal in the way that you've described? If we if we rush and if we simply look to do a, a quick kind of like repair job rather than full restoration, then we're not going to sort out those longer term, you know, those longer term problems. And and, and even if we get sort of like relatively short term gains in terms of attainment in school across a narrow range of measures. That is not going to. That's not going to do what we need to do around the eradication of poverty. And um, that that too would be would be tinkering around the edges. Albeit that we, that, that we would make things better in some ways for um, you know a, a cohort of young people. It's it's not the, the the hope. We have to we have to take the opportunity coming out of the pandemic to reframe and rethink so many aspects of our society. And if we're genuinely committed to social justice. That has to be your know, equality and social justice, equity, all of that. That has to be across a range of a range of um, policy domains. Um, so I know that employment is reserved, but employment, housing, transport, social security, all of these things, um, and education, you know, and other you know, education, social services, all facets um, of our of our public service playing their part um, towards the towards the endeavour. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm finished unless any of the other panellists want to come in. Mike? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, just to reinforce some of those points, but I mean, our members are saying that they've had a, a massive increase in workload to keep the system going. Um, as has been touched on, there's been a huge increase in behavioural issues with pupils that teachers haven't to deal with. Um, Andrea touched on the, the mental health crisis, uh, no doubt informed by trauma in many pupils, but that applies to teachers as well. Um, and there is a desire, perhaps it's an understandable desire, to somehow get back to normal, but there is really no normal uh, anymore. Um, and there seems to be a lack of recognition of where teachers are currently at. Um, and that has manifest, manifested itself in 67% of our members in a survey back in January that they had considered leaving the profession 
in the last 12 months. So what we're facing is a looming recruitment and retention crisis, uh, and there will be no recovery without teachers. So all of these matters need to be addressed and addressed in the ways that they have been touched on earlier. Uh, if we want to help pupils and have that individual or small group work to help them, we need more teachers, we need teachers who are not being as worked as hard, not having as many classes, not having as many people in their classes. So all of these points that were touched on earlier uh, are absolutely vital. And that gets us back to that overall national funding, which currently is inadequate if we're going to get where we need to be. And Greg Dempster. I just add to, to add a little bit to the points that Andrea made. Um, um, Mr. Rennie asked about realities in school at the moment, and I would agree with everything that Andrea was saying there. But that intensification of need that she talked about, I'm hearing about that particularly from those who have nursery classes or nursery schools, and they're seeing a, a big increase in dysregulated behaviours, which we will presumably see progress into and through primary schools as well. So there's a I need to keep an eye on that and perhaps for further investment there. Also, a reality in school at the moment, which would lead me to say we're still within the pandemic. You're saying that some say we're in it and some were coming out of it, is the huge amounts of staff absence that there's been has swallowed up in turn huge amounts of school leadership time covering classes. Um, so that's a that's a real impact for our members. And implications, um, just to add, not replace any of the implications that Andrea was saying. The desirability of school leadership roles, um, I'm hearing from our surveys of members, is um, waning quite significantly. There's already been problems about recruitment into headship, particularly in some areas, but, but across the board, there, there is an issue about recruiting heads within to, uh, into the primary sector in particular. And we ask members, um, deputies, we ask them, uh, to respond to the statement, I am a deputy head teacher and I am keen to become a head teacher. 18% of those who responded were positive. 18. Dear. So that would, to me, be an implication. That's a drop off from the first time the survey was 2016 and it was 35.7% were positive. It's a significant drop off over time. Okay. Thank you. And Jim Thielis. Uh, not to notwithstanding the points that my colleagues have made, all of which I uh, align with and I'm in tune with, but one or two points just to, to kind of raise in relation to your question, Mr Rennie. Uh, the first one, in relation to what school like just now, what school has been like over the course of the past 18 months or so has been an effort in keeping the school open for all of the very varied reasons why schools have been kept open. We've understood that, that's what we've done. And the level of pressure that school leaders have been under to do that has been well detailed by my, colleague, by my colleagues earlier. In terms of moving forward here, I already said it's very important, and it's important in the context of our duty of care to young people right now and their future development, not to separate recovery from improvement. Recovery needs to happen on account of what we are going through. Improvement is the obligation which we have to young people within school and young people within school at any point in time. That having been said, there will be a cost to pay in the future in relation to physical, mental health and well-being, in relation to what we have experienced. There will be a cost to pay in the future, sometime in the very near future perhaps, in relation to the cost of living and the increase in real-time poverty which young people are experiencing. So we have got to be very astute in the decision-making process that we're going through just now, and very conscious of the fact that we, you know, the pandemic may be over, but life is not going to be the same, and life chances for young people are going to be very, very challenging. Life for the staff within school and the level of pressure which they've put up with over the course of the past two years and the kind of cost to pay in relation to that in the future has got to be taken account of in relation to the decisions which we make just now. So it's important that we start to look in terms of reform agenda and where we go at better, different ways of working, a different ethos within schools and a different relationship that we have with our school communities. 
And there is an opportunity there, and I think I've said earlier on this morning, it's very, very important that we do not miss that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Willie Rennie. Um, this brings to an end uh, the first uh, part of our meeting today. Uh, I thank our, our panel, Greg Dempster, Andrea Bradley, Mike Corbett and Jim Thewlis for joining us this morning and giving us the benefit of their evidence. Um, and with that, I uh, wish you all a, a good morning. We'll have a short suspension and allow the witnesses to leave and we will continue to agenda item three. Welcome back. Our next item of business is to consider the Legislative Consent Memorandum, LCM S617, on the British Sign Language Bill, UK Parliament legislation. The bill recognises British Sign Language as a language of England, Scot Wales and Scotland, places a duty on the Secretary of State to report on the promotion and facilitation of the use of BSL by ministerial government departments, and places a duty on the Secretary of State to issue guidance on the general promotion and facilitation of BSL. The entirety of the bill extends to Scotland. Clauses 1, 2 and 3 all relate to the reserved matter of equal opportunities, but fall within one of the exceptions to that reservation. As such, each of these provisions relate to matters which the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Ministers have competence for. The Scottish Government is recommending consent, because whilst the Scottish Parliament has passed the British Sign Language Scotland Act 2015, and has established a precedence of support for the promotion of BSL, this bill will additionally recognise in statute BSL as a language of Scotland. Further, the Scottish Government states that the bill will be beneficial to Scotland's BSL communities as it will promote the use of BSL in Scotland, particularly in relation to reserved functions. The committee considered its approach to the scrutiny of this LCM at its meeting on 30th March and agreed to write to the Scottish Government seeking an update on progress since the introduction of the 2015 Act. The response from the Minister for Children and Young People included, was included in members' papers. The Minister states that a significant part of the Act is delivered through the BSL National Plan 2017-2023. to A new National Plan will be published and implemented following the conclusion of the current plan at the end of 2023. 
Do members have any comments? I mean, I think I just want to comment that um, I think I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about the fact that Scotland has played a very leading role in, in terms of the 2015 Act, and I think that's a, a point of progress that should be noted and, and commented upon. And the other thing is the fact that this uh, UK uh, Parliament piece of legislation establishes BSL's allowance for Scotland, I think, is also to be very much welcomed. I think we're all in agreement. Are members content that a short report prepared by the clerks and signed off by myself and the Deputy Convener be prepared? And the report should be ideally published by the end of this week. Um, is the committee minded to recommend in its report that the Parliament agree to legislative consent motion in terms outlined in the LCM? Are we content? We're content. The next item of business is to consider two pieces of subordinate legislation under the negative instrument procedure. The first instrument to be considered is the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Fees, Coronavirus Amendment Regulations 2022 SSI 2022-97. Do members have any comments on the instrument? Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? We're agreed. The next instrument for consideration is the Teachers' Pension Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2022 SSI 2022-102. Do members have any comments on this instrument? Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? Thank you. The public part of today's meeting is now at an end. I will now suspend the meeting. And can I ask members to reconvene on Microsoft Teams in five minutes? This will allow us to consider our final agenda items in private. Thank you and good morning.